This is the Skywatch Media News Channel for June 1, 2019. Last month, Stanton Friedman, one of the great UFO researchers of our generation, passed away unexpectedly at the Toronto Pearson Airport on his way home from a speaking engagement in Columbus, Ohio. He was 84 years old. Mr. Freeman was a nuclear physicist by profession in the 1960s, but left his work to devote himself full-time to studying extraterrestrial life on Earth and to lecturing full-time beginning in 1967. He received a great deal of notoriety for his civilian investigation of the Roswell incident in 1947 and co-authored a book on the investigation in 1992 titled Crash at Corona the U.S. military retrieval and cover-up of a UFO. I had the privilege of interviewing Mr. Freeman on talk radio in July 2009. What made Mr. Freeman uniquely qualified to speak on the subject of ufology was his background as a rocket scientist. He was intellectually gifted with a keen ability to speak the people's language. In several books, many television appearances, and hundreds of speeches around the world, Mr. Friedman demonstrated little doubt that alien spaceships had come and gone and that extraterrestrials had walked the earth. Here, then, is the audio podcast of my interview with the renowned UFO researcher, Stanton Friedman. Good morning and welcome to this edition of the Earth Frenzy Radio Show here on the blog Talk Radio Network. This month we're going to be devoting our airtime to the subject of UFOs, what you may or may not know about flying saucers and alien visitors from other worlds, worlds that reach far beyond our solar system. Ever since the so-called Roswell incident in which an alien craft crashed outside of Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947, Many people have considered whether the military and high-ranking government officials have been on a crusade to uh, suppress the truth about UFOs and alien life forms. Today our a very special guest, Stanton Friedman, is considered as one of the most highly recognized and foremost UFO researchers in the world. Since 1967, he has lectured on the topic of UFOs in all 50 states nine Canadian provinces, and in 16 countries spread across the globe. He has published a number of books on UFOs and close encounters, including his latest book published in June of uh, 2008, Flying Saucers and Science. So we're pleased to have him here today. Welcome to the show, Stan. Glad to be on. Well, you know, your, your biography mentions that, um, that you have a background in, in, in nuclear physics, of course. Now, was it during your time working as a physicist that you, you became interested in, on the top, topic of flying saucers? Yes, uh, I was. Uh, it was all by accident, not prearranged, not pre-planned. I was ordering books from Marlboro Books in New York, a discount book place. This is way back in 1958. I was a young nuclear physicist at General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department. And I needed one more book so we wouldn't have to pay shipping. And there was the report on unidentified flying objects by Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, who had been head of Project Blue Book in the early 50s. And it was marked down from 2.95 to a dollar. It was a hardcover book. Still have it around here someplace. And uh, I figured uh, three things. One, it wasn't going to cost me anything because shipping would have been a dollar if I hadn't bought the book. Two, uh, the Air Force was co-sponsor on our program uh, with the Atomic Energy Commission, so uh, they were good guys. Uh, three, uh, if these things were real, and I had no idea, I didn't have an opinion, you shouldn't when you don't have any data, uh, then maybe they were using nuclear reactors and that would help our program. Uh, and finally, four, of course, uh, if it was worthless, uh, so it would be worth a laugh. It wasn't costing me anything anyway. So I read the book. I was impressed, not fully convinced, but intrigued. A lot of good stuff in there. As it turns out, it was a very lucky first book. And I've talked to several other people over the years who have found that that was the book that got them started. And I, I shared it with a neighbor. Charlie was 10 years older than I was, an engineer, and he was more impressed than I was. Moved off to California, had a good librarian, read 15 more books, some of which were 
utter garbage. If I'd read them first, I probably would never read another book. Uh, and then I found my uh, wow moment, if you will, I was finding a copy of the largest study ever done for the United States Air Force, Project Blue Book, Special Report Number 14. This is at the University of California Berkeley Library about 1960. And I was shocked on a couple of levels. One, none of the books I'd read had mentioned it, which was rather strange. Uh, here's a study with more than 3,200 sightings being investigated, 240 charts, tables, graphs, and maps. And what really shocked me, though, was not only that I hadn't heard about it, despite all the reading I had done, but that the, the guy who put this together, I mean, who privately published it, this is before Freedom of Information, uh, he got a copy somehow and published it, um, that included the press release that the Air Force put out on October 25, 1955. And I was astonished, because I'd been looking at this report, that the Secretary of the Air Force, mind you, said, quote, on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available, unquote. The problem here is that having read the report and looked at the tables, I'm a data hound, uh, always was, and he was lying through his teeth. The unknowns weren't 3%. I mean, if he'd said 3.9, you know, and I wouldn't have worried, but it was 21.5%. That's a long way from 3. Furthermore, they had a separate category, insufficient information. So the assertion that, you know, if more complete observational data had been available, that's nonsense. They had a separate category for that. So that was the first thing that disturbed me. Secondly, uh, they did a quality evaluation. They found the better the quality of the site, the more likely to be unexplainable. And they also did uh, a statistical cross-comparison between unknowns, the only ones we're interested in, really, and knowns. And they found the probability, this is based on things like apparent size, color, shape, speed, that sort of thing. They found the probability that the unknowns were just misknowns was less than 1%. So here's the Secretary of the Air Force saying, oh, nothing to it. You know, if we just had more data, we'd have taken care of all of them. Well, it was hogwash. Now, you know, I was working under security. I had a clearance for 14 years. And sometimes you have to um, tiptoe around uh, information. You don't want to lie, but you don't want to reveal classified information either. But this was blatant, flat-out lying, and that bothered me, frankly. And so I joined a couple of UFO groups, uh, read a lot more, uh, got their newsletters and stuff, and uh, again, serendipitously, if there is such a word, uh, my first public thing, I had asked Frank Edwards, who had written the best-selling Flying Saucer Serious Business, I had gotten to know him in uh, uh, Indianapolis when I worked for General Motors there. I kept working on canceled government-sponsored programs. That wasn't my intent, but that's the way it worked out. Uh, Frank sent me a copy of the book, and I said, hey, give me some clues, Frank. I want to go public. So he gave me the name, among others, of the producer of a radio show in Pittsburgh, KDKA, which is the big station, the oldest big right, station right. in the country. And... Uh, the program, I love the title of the program, it was called Contact. <laughs> and uh, Mike Levine, still remember him. Uh, I called them, just the, the producer, and uh, it was one of those, uh, don't call us, we'll call you, even though in West, in uh, Pittsburgh, being a Westinghouse nuclear physicist was a, a big plus. If you went for a loan, not if you want to get on a radio program, apparently. <laughs> anyway, less than a month later, he called me because somebody had canceled he calls me at 6.30, uh, could I please be on their show at 7 o'clock? Lord knows, I, I, I wish I could find out how many people he called before he called me, but I live near the station. So I went on the show. Somebody at work heard me and wanted me to speak to her book review club. Uh, Frank's book was on the table, so to speak. That was my first lecture, was in her living room. I did the program more times. I did a lot more freebies. 
I had a breakthrough speaking at Carnegie Mellon University. The guy liked me so much, he sent a nice letter to the agent through whom he uh, booked the other speakers and paid them nice fees, unlike mine. <laughs> and, and they got me booked at uh, the Engineering Society of Detroit. Now, you, you can't call them a bunch of nuts or little old ladies in tennis shoes or anything like that. And they were sold out, as it turns out, three weeks in advance for 1,008 people for dinner and a talk, and there wasn't one negative question. Now, that had a profound effect on me. I mean, I was young, and I was impressed by these older engineers and scientists, and I did a lot of technical groups, including, for example, the American Nuclear Society chapter at Los Alamos, New Mexico. We had over 500 people, and they were friendly, and a bunch of sections of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and the Institute of Electrical and Electrical Engineers and several other just straight engineering societies, Baltimore, uh, uh, Cincinnati, et cetera. So, when, Dan, do they ever do they ever screen people that attend these uh, conferences or these symposiums in order to keep the nuts out? I don't think so. I mean, my talks were just, uh, I can't say they were all public talks, but if they're sponsored by uh, uh, American Nuclear Society or Institute of Electric Electronic Engineers, there's no screening. It's, it's put out for their membership uh, primarily. But at the public lectures, I'd already started doing the college circuit and uh, they're not screened at all. So it's not like a political event where you're trying to keep people out that are going to disrupt them? No, no. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, it's interesting because I've only had 11 hecklers in over 700 lectures. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good ratio. <laughs> well, I'm told, although I can't know from personal experience, that if you talk about sports, religion, or politics, you'll get a higher percentage of right. hecklers than that. And it, two of those 11 were drunk, so... You know, I don't worry about it. And I come on strong, lest people wonder. I'm not an apologist ufologist. I'm not a closet ufologist. I don't say I think there's a possibility that perhaps the planet is being visited. I start off by giving four major conclusions. Now, after 51 years of study and investigation, the first is the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some, underlined 35 times, some UFOs are really in spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about that. My second conclusion, equally dogmatic, if you will, is that the subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic Watergate. That does not mean that everybody in the government knows what's going on. That's not how you keep secrets. You restrict by having a, an appropriate security clearance and a need to know. So some people in government have known since at least July 1947 that we indeed are being visited. The third conclusion, again dogmatic if you will, is that there are no good arguments against the first two. And I think I've heard them all, including from my University of Chicago classmate Carl Sagan, who spoke out without benefit of having facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. And finally, fourth, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium, a visit to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, bodies and wreckage, for 62 years. So, uh, in other words, uh, there's nothing there that's going to discourage the heckler. <laughs> I'm, I'm right, but uh, judging by the question and answer periods, um, people are intrigued, they're excited. Now, I... I must admit, uh, off to the side, I'm a little sneaky. Uh, in my normal lectures, uh, I talk about five large-scale scientific studies, the first one being this Blue Book Special Report 14 that I mentioned. And after each one, I describe what's in it, show a slide, so forth. And I say, uh, how many people here have read this? And if I'm lucky, it's 1% or 2%. So uh, admittedly, if a guy's going to take me on, uh, he has to admit he hasn't read any of the data that I based my conclusions on. Uh, this has happened. Uh, one guy interrupted, interrupted. Finally, the host said, uh, you know, let him finish. Well, in the question and answer, I'm sure I, one could come to other conclusions than the ones that you've reached. And I quite casually said, as I recall, you hadn't read any of those five large-scale scientific studies I discussed, right? Uh, yeah. Well, that's the difference between us, isn't it? 
I gave you my conclusions. I gave you the sources of evidence that I based those conclusions on. You haven't read any of those. Whose opinion is worth more? There was a long silence, and then we went on to something else. Would, would you say with skeptics that the problem is, is, is that they're just not educated when it comes to the topic of flying saucers, or, or do you think it's just because because of the ignorance factor, they just wish not to believe. Well, I think it's it's a combination of both of those things. Uh, there are four basic rules for debunkers, and I suppose they all have to do with ego. Uh, one is, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. Two, what the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. Three, if you can't attack the data, attack the people. And fourth, do your research by proclamation rather than investigation, because it's not worth spending your time on investigation. Uh, and nobody will know the difference anyway. Now, uh, in other words, once they've reached a conclusion, because they haven't looked at the evidence, because they start with a conclusion, if you will, uh, their minds are closed. And they're sure that they're, uh, they're on the right track. And I've taken on some of these people when I have the chance. I've done debates on coast-to-coast -coast radio and uh, at Oxford University Debating Society and, you know, formal ones. Uh, James McGaha, an Air Force retired captain pilot who says people aren't qualified observers. Uh, we, and he says it loudly and on Larry King and other places, uh, we debated formally at uh, Middle Tennessee State University uh, Two hours. It's on a DVD. It's on my listed on my website. Uh, it's called "Are Flying Saucers Real?" My website's uh, www.stantonfriedman.com, and it's a two-hour formal debate. So I've taken these guys on, and I think it's a combination of things. I think some of them may have ulterior motives. You know, maybe they work for the government, and their job is to make it look as if there's nothing to this subject. I don't know. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I worked under security. I never felt I was conspiring because I didn't reveal classified information. Mm -hmm. And But uh, some people, it's an ego thing. And there's also what I call the, <laughs> funny title, the David Susskind syndrome. Uh, David was a sharp guy who had a, a television talk show many years ago. And in the early 70s, there was a big wave of sightings. And he called his people, not him, called me. I was living in Southern California. He wanted to do a show about UFOs. He wanted a good recent uh, observer. I had the coin helicopter case that had taken place just a couple weeks before. Uh, he wanted a good skeptic. I said, there aren't any, but here's how to reach Philip Class. Uh, you know, I, I gave him everything. He wanted to send me all kinds of stuff, so I did. I went to New York to do the show, and it was done in segments, uh, no, li no live audience uh, taped. And between segments, he says, you know, I read the New York Times. There's nothing in there that says there's anything to this subject. So the syndrome goes like this. I take great pride in keeping uh, uh, aware of important things. And there's no question that if aliens were visiting Earth and the government was covering it up, that would be important. However, if that was the case, I would know about it. And I don't, so it must not be, and I'm not going to waste my time uh, you know, looking into something that doesn't exist. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Gee, I didn't find anything. Well, you didn't look either, you know. <laughs> and so there are people afflicted with this problem. Uh, some of them are in the media. Uh, I've dealt with some of them on radio and television. Uh, look at Bill Nye, the science guy, who was on Larry King. I uh, didn't know a right. darn thing about the subject. <laughs> Made several foolish claims. Uh, for example, when uh, Robert Hastings, who's written a fine book on nukes and UFOs, was talking about 10 missiles going down at Malmstra Air Force Base, you know, missiles with nuclear weapons on board, with a UFO sitting out over the facility, oh, it was just a power failure. It's triply redundant <laughs> power, for goodness sakes. You know, he had an explanation for Roswell. Oh, that was a Skyhook balloon. Well, none had even flown at the time. Sky well, these people seem to have an explanation for everything, don't they? Yeah, but it has nothing to do with the facts, the data, or whatever. Uh, 
and I have spoken. That's the way it is. As a matter of fact, that's practically what he said when we were, uh, ran across each other at uh, Larry King. I tried to tell him that that explanation made no sense because he said it was a spy balloon. The skyhook wasn't at that time. But that's the way it is, he said, and stalked away. I mean, like, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. So, you know, I don't know what, where he's coming from, although I, I should uh, mention I had a note from his ex-wife who said he usually spends just a few minutes on the Internet before he does a program. So, Well, that, there you go. That explains that's how you learn brain surgery, isn't it, while standing on one foot? <laughs> you know, now, now that we're talking about balloons, you know, you're one of the um, original investigators of the uh, Roswell crash. And, and the original? What do you mean? Okay, uh, the. And you described, <laughs> you described your experience with, uh, with this incident in a, in a publication called uh, Crash at Corona. Now, yeah. This particular incident took place in 1947, but even today, some 62 years later, we're still discussing this crash. And, and I was just in Roswell last week. Yeah. I, I, here's the question for you, Stan. Do, do you feel that, um, that the Roswell incident will ever be fully solved, or is this just left, going to be left to speculation? Well, it's a combination of things. Uh, I don't predict the future particularly. I mean, I'm presuming the sun's going to come up tomorrow if it's not too cloudy up here in Fredericton, New Brunswick. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm still optimistic. There was a new witness present at, uh, in Roswell. Uh, I was on a panel with uh, three other serious investigators, Don Schmidt. Now, you said you were just there, right? Yeah, I got back Monday night. Uh, okay. This, this was the annual festival. Right, uh, right. Four days. I gave four lectures, was on a panel with uh, uh, Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, and Dr. David Rudiak, all about Roswell. And a man was introduced who was a crew member on the plane that carried one of the loads of bodies. And so we're still finding a few new people. What my real hope is, well, twofold, I guess, one was that there would be a new Woodward Bernstein team working on blowing the lid off the cosmic water gate. I mean, Washington Post put a lot of dough into that, not only their time, but people following the money, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, research takes time and therefore money. It's people's time. Uh, so, you know, maybe we'll get lucky with a younger generation of reporters uh, who now don't all believe the government tells the truth all the time. Would you believe that? Oh, yeah. uh, that, that's one hope. <laughs> Another hope is that somebody will make more of a deathbed confession, will pull out some documents he held back, or a couple of pieces of metal. Wouldn't that be nice? And that they get analyzed at a good forensic testing lab, not at a university. <laughs> and we have unambiguous evidence from that, and the guy can establish uh, you know, that he is who he says he was, uh, is, and where he served and all that. Uh, when I, my last conversation with the retired General Thomas Jefferson DuBose, he's in those pictures with General Ramey in some of the pictures. Okay. He was chief of staff. Ramey was head of the 8th Air Force. The 509th in Roswell reported to Ramey. So chain of command. And I managed to locate him. And very good conversations. I met with him in person. In the last phone conversation we had, he said, I like what you're doing. If I remember anything else, I'll let you know. What can they do to me now? He was 87, I think, at the time. <laughs> so we need some more people like that, uh, in other words, who finally decide, oh, what the heck, might as well talk. You know, somebody's on his last legs, knows he's got a cancer or whatever. And if, if people go to my website at www.stantonfriedman.com, it tells you how to get in touch with me, phone numbers, email, all the rest of that. And I don't use witness names without permission. And I'd like to follow up on any new good witnesses that we have. And there does need to be care here. Obviously, the government would not be excited about people putting up proof. Okay, it really it's the government calling in, get that guy That's off. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to censor you. How's that? Well, you know, people have asked, uh, honest to God, people say, how come you're still alive, Stan? 
I say, I, you know, I take a lot of vitamins and minerals, but what do you mean? Well, with all your comments about the cosmic water gate and the government, I would have think, thought somebody would go after. I said, hey, I'm not going to live my life looking over my shoulder, and I may be doing what they'd like to be done, that is getting the public ready for whenever that big moment comes. I mean, you know, what if a saucer circles around inside a sporting event uh, stadium when the roof's open, of course, uh, you know, on national television, say the World Soccer matches, the World Series, uh, the NFL, uh, the Super Bowl, or something like that. Uh, somebody's got to be ready. And the more uh, approval rating there is for UFOs, the easier it will be on the government. Uh, and incidentally, you know, one of the chapters in Flying Saucers and Science deals with public opinion polls. And it's, it's total nonsense that most people don't believe in UFOs. Uh, the kicker is most people believe that other people don't believe in UFOs, so they act accordingly. They don't right, report right. sightings. I checked a class of 100 students at a university, and I said, look, I want to know your view about this, not your neighbor's views. Can you close your eyes for a couple minutes and vote with your hands, and the instructor and I will count the votes. To make a long story short, because I was very careful in how I worded it, uh, 80% thought most people didn't believe in flying saucers. 80% did believe in flying saucers in that group. That's a big gulf, in other words. And so, so, so we're we're led to believe now that 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 a, a good percentage, or mo most of the people now, do believe that there is some kind of alien life. Well, it's not just they're two separate questions. Is there life out there? to find however you want it, but away from here. And is some of that life coming here? Now, I take issue, as you know, with the SETI cultists, as I call them. Uh, SETI stands for a silly effort to investigate, not search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know. Uh, they're, they're basing everything they're doing. There's guys out there sending radio signals using the same kind of technology that we have, and they're sending them directly to us, and if we just wait long enough, we'll pick up the signal, and it'll be the greatest discovery in man's history. Pass the butter, Marge, please. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh, we got a signal from 500 light years away. They keep moving the distance. At one point, they thought it would be within 50 light years, and then 100, then 500, Jill Tarter, Dr. Jill Tarter of the SETI group, uh, she's at Berkeley, uh, you know, fine scientist, but she wrote a paper a year ago that uh, there's probably another civilization within a thousand light years, and we'll, make, we'll pick up their signal, and when we do, it'll be the greatest discovery, and they'll help us solve our problems. Hey, out there, we got a problem here. Can you give us some help 2,000 years later? Hi, what can we do for you guys? I mean, it makes no sense. So They must think we're all uh, quite naive when it comes to that, huh? Well, they do, but remember, if aliens are coming here, who needs radio telescopes? <laughs> Maybe you should learn sign language, you know? Uh, it, 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 it's a strange world. In other words, you throughout the SETI literature, they always refer to UFOs, but usually with a the comment, there is no evidence. And yet those five large-scale scientific studies that I mentioned, you never find reference to them. Now, the first job on a scientific research project, you're going to do a thesis or a small contract, you do a literature search, darn it. You don't say there is no data. You say, hmm, wonder what I can find. Uh, and because with a thesis, you don't want to discover halfway through that somebody else has already done <laughs> the work you're claiming is going to be unique and special. So... It, it, all I can do is feel pity for them uh, that they're stuck in an untenable position. They're making claims for which there is no evidence, and they're ignoring the data. They're also presuming, they don't talk about this much, but not only that there's nobody f flying around interstellar travel and stuff, because it's so much cheaper to send a signal instead of fly. How come that plane from L.A. to... Sydney, Australia was so full is what I want to know. <laughs> but they also presume that there's no colonization and no migration. And think about that for a minute. What if Society A, say at Zeta-1 or Zeta-2, a planet around Zeta-1 or Zeta-2 reticuli, the two stars that turn up in the Betty Hill star map uh, as being the 
probably the base stars in that map. They're only 39 light years away. None of this thousand light years away. 39.3. Uh, suppose because they're a billion years older than the sun, and because they have near neighbors an eighth of a light year apart, we're out in the boonies here, and I don't mean Frederick, I mean the solar system. Uh, suppose they set up a colony at another star system, and they set up a colony at another one. Now, one of the key factors in the so-called Drake equation. This is going to tell us how many civilizations there are in the galaxy. Uh, it's not truly an equation in the scientific sense. We make a whole bunch of guesses. I call it dartboard physics. But one of the key terms is, what's the lifespan of a civilization? Now, we don't even have data on one, our own. What's our lifespan? You know, we don't know how long we're going to last. And we, we don't, don't even you know. We, we, we talk about... Um talk about aliens traveling vast distances, you know, to, to visit the planet. It's down the street. It's not yeah. vast distances. But, you know, I guess a lot of people are wondering what type of, of sophisticated uh, technology would, would make it possible to travel through time and space. Well, I don't know where the time and space, uh, where the time gets in there anyway. But, you know, by using terms like vast distances, uh, you know, and we often hear those, uh, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Andromeda is about a little over 2 million light years away. Do I care about that? Not a bit. Within 54 light years. Well, over most people don't stars. understand that anyway. They don't understand when you say light years, nobody knows what you're talking about. Yes, they do. They know it's the distance light travels in the year, and they know light moves awful fast. Now, the physicists will tell you that light moves at 300,000 kilometers a second. A more useful unit of measurement is 670 million miles an hour. So I'll go halfway, a third of the way across the solar system in an hour. Uh, but the kicker here is that why look that far? You know, what's that old joke about why, what are you doing out there? The guy's looking around under the light post. I'm looking for my keys. Well, where'd you lose them? Well, over there. Well, why are you looking here? Well, because that's where the light is. Uh, <laughs> you know, so the... The uh, notion that you've got to look a long distance away. But let, let's talk specifics here. Now, I worked on fission nuclear rockets. We tested them successfully. The biggest one, the Phoebus 2B, operated by Los Alamos National Laboratory. Way back in the late 60s, mind you, operated at a power level of 4,400 megawatts. That's twice the power of Grand Coulee Dam. Seven feet in diameter, mind you. Uh, that's a lot of oomph per cubic foot, if you will, or per, per pound. But much more exciting to me is nuclear fusion. Now, you say, how does that get in here? Well, it's the major source of energy throughout the universe. The stars produce their energy by nuclear fusion. We didn't find that out until 1938, mind you. Hans Bethe, a brilliant scientist at Cornell University, figured it out theoretically. Those are the processes that produce the energy. Now, being Earthlings the way we are, we put that to use. In 1952, we exploded the first hydrogen bomb, which is a nuclear fusion device. It was pretty good wallop. The energy release was the equivalent of 10 million tons of TNT. 10 million tons. Now, the fireball, when that thing went off, this was on an island in the Pacific, of course, not in downtown Los Angeles, although some people might be happy about that. But anyway, uh, Fireball was three miles in diameter. That was 1952. The Russians, uh, a number of years later, tested one that was the equivalent of 57 million tons of TNT. God knows what the aliens thought about that when they saw it. But uh, now here's the kicker. I worked on fusion propulsion systems. We had a $9 million study at Aerojet General Nucleonics. That's one of the smaller programs I've worked on. Um, and it turns out if you use the right stuff in the right way and kick particles out the back end of a rocket, charged particles, which is very convenient, that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in the dumb old chemical rocket. So why do people say no possible means? I mean, and, oh, I better throw in another fact here. Uh, 
it takes one year at 1G acceleration to get close to the speed of light. I've had estimates of 1,000, 100, or 10 years. One year at 1G. So it's not like we're talking the impossible. You've got to lose a, a, use a little imagination. And incidentally, to go back to the H-bombs, I said 10 million ton equivalent. That's the first one we tested. Uh, during World War II, the big bombs were 10-ton blockbusters. So we went from 10 tons to 10 million tons. So uh, one of Friedman's mantras, if you will, I make them up as I go along, is that technological prog progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. A laser isn't just a better light bulb. Entirely different physics. A fusion bomb is not just better TNT. Entirely different physics. And, you know, we even in our own world recognize some of this. The nuclear navy, besides having submarines that go around the world underwater, which is kind of a neat trick, without surfacing, I mean, uh, they have aircraft carriers, huge ones, quarter mile long or so, and uh, they can operate on fission power for 18 years without refueling. Hmm. Now think about how many tankers of diesel fuel you'd need to replace that. Yep. So w what I'm saying is the people who say you can't get here from there and no known means of uh, – energy production could possibly duplicate that. The, the great American astronomer, Simon Newcomb of the 19th century, uh, was quoted uh, a few months before the Wright brothers' first flight about no possible means of flying except with a balloon. Uh, the British astronomer Royal said space travel is utter bilge. Uh, that was a year before Sputnik. And nobody would pay because it would be a waste of money to develop a space travel. And look at all the great astronomical data we've gotten from the Hubble and Chandra and Fermi observatories. There's a bunch more. Well, I believe that uh, <clears> H.G. <throat> Wells had imagined all of this taking place at some point in time, didn't he? Well, some of it, not all of it. Uh, he wasn't a big enthusiast, enthusiast about flight. He was quoted uh, around 1900 uh, that probably by 1950 people would be flying. Uh, the kicker is that there are different people involved in theory and in practice. Uh, both uh, Albert Einstein and Lord Rutherford, two Nobel Prize winning physicists, brilliant men, at one time or another said there would be no way to get useful energy out of e equals mc squared. Now, of course, they said it before we'd even discovered the neutron, for goodness sakes and before we discovered fission. That was done by other people. Now, one of the rare birds was Enrico Fermi, one of my idols, I guess. Uh, he's the one who put together the first nuclear chain reaction at the University of Chicago. And he was one of the reasons I went to the University of Chicago. Of course, he died while I was there of cancer, probably produced by all the experiments he'd done with neutrons. But he was one of the very few that was brilliant in both theory and experiment. But people often just can't, again, bright people, very bright people, can't look beyond what they know to realize that there might be something new. I mean, lasers are something new. Who envisioned them, you know? Do uh, you think there's some kind of fear factor in that? Uh, well, there's ego fear factor. Uh, uh, if I'm being looked up to as the professor expert on science, and there's something I don't know, I'd rather say it doesn't exist than say, well, I don't know. There's another problem here, too, that people may not be aware of. Most of the people in academia have no idea of how big industrial research programs are and how much money gets spent on them. I mentioned I worked on nuclear airplanes in 1958. We were spending at General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department one hundred million dollars that year. We employed thirty five hundred people full time, of whom eleven hundred were engineers and scientists. That was a lot of money in nineteen fifty eight. Right. It wasn't eight professors and twenty grad students, which would be a big campus research program. The jet the um, stealth fighter Lockheed spent 
ten billion dollars in ten years developing that in secret, mind you. For academics, uh, it's publish or perish. In the real world, the industrial world, you put out classified reports. You give papers at classified meetings. The pay is good. The equipment you need, you get. You work with other smart people. I had somebody tell me it must be terrible to work under security. I never felt that way. I did some great experiments. Uh, you know, I was young. I had authority to do experiments, and it was great fun. And I, what do I care about publish or perish? You know, I wrote a lot of reports, technical reports. Uh, some of them I still don't have copies of. <laughs> uh, so th there's a, a lack of realism in the academic community. Uh, the budget for the three nuclear weapons labs, I checked this several years ago, was greater than all the money spent by the National F Science Foundation on research projects in academia. Uh, that's just the three nuclear weapons labs. It's not all the other facilities that are out there going strong. So you need a, I, I need to correct. I, I, I'm fortunate. I bring to the table on this subject a peculiar background. <laughs> uh, I worked on far-out propulsion systems, so I can deal with the you can't get here from there kind of nonsense. I worked under security, so I can certainly deal with the uh, the government can't cover things up. I've been to 20 archives. The Eisenhower Library still has over 200,000 pages of classified material. He went out of office in 1961. I believe there was a lot of things that happened during his administration. Craig, is this when the uh, flying saucers were hovering over the Capitol? 19, no, that was just before him. Uh, that was in uh, the summer of 52 while Truman was still president. Okay, all right. And there's a fine book, uh, Shoot Them Down, by Frank Faschino, Jr. He talks about the events of 1952, which incidentally included not only the Flatwoods Monster case that Frank did a great deal of good research on, but also uh, the, the UFOs over the White House uh, business of 1952, and also the fact that there's a five-year period in which there were over 200 fatal military interceptor crashes in the United States, including five cases in which pilots had had more than 100 missions in Korea, you know, where the MiGs were up there trying to shoot them down, mm -hmm. come back to the United States, no MiGs, and crashed and were killed. And the New York Times, in listing these things, uh, used terms sometimes like disintegrated and disappeared. You know, that's the first time that, I, that I've, I've, heard, I've heard of that. Well, uh, hey, you've yeah. got to read Frank's book. It's listed on my <laughs> website at www.fantonfriedman.com. Now, 52 was a big year, and what we didn't know until we really dug into that, I wrote the forward in the epilogue, was that orders were issued in 1952 to military pilots to shoot down UFOs if they don't land when instructed to do so. You can think of a lot of cartoons that would go with that. But uh, I have had seven different reports of planes going up to chase UFOs and never coming back. Now, if I've heard seven, there's got to be a lot more than that out there because uh, I certainly don't know about them. Uh, people need somebody to talk to quietly, you know. Uh, Dan, do you think that some of the um, disappearances of boats and planes over the uh, – Bermuda Triangle has anything to do with uh, with uh, flying saucers or UFOs? Well, there's one case I know about. One of the seven cases involved MIG, uh, two MIG, I forget which model they were, uh, chasing uh, a UFO that uh, I, I talked to a guy who was listening at an NSA, National Security Agency, listening post in Boca Chica, Florida. It's the closest one to Cuba. And uh, the Cuban Air Defense Command picks up uh, – an unknown, heading southwest at Mach 1, and they scramble a couple of jets, and they see it, uh, and they report down, spherical object, no appendages, uh, and they send out the standard signal for get the heck away from our territory, <laughs> you know, international transmission kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, no change, so they ask the ground, what should they do? Uh, shoot it down. 
So the lead plane uh, gets his radar lock on, his missiles are armed, and suddenly the pilot in the second plane screeches that he, his, the lead plane just disintegrated. And uh, our guys are listening to all of this, and that was in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. And it was interesting that they send a timeline, a translation uh, of the, uh, the transmissions that they had heard, and they sent it to NSA headquarters, and NSA says, send us the original tape. And I talked to the guy. I said, well, uh, is it possible they thought they'd get more information from the tape, you know, slow down the conversation or whatever? He said, it could be. I don't know. But it was rare that they would ask for that. So uh, that was in the area of the Bermuda Triangle. I can't say nothing ever happened there because something did. But would, remember would there be now, any, any threat to, uh, let's say, to the national security that, that we should be concerned about when we hear about these, these type of incidents? Well, of course. I mean, if you lose seven aircraft at least, uh, you know, that's a threat to national security. But remember, and here's a an, very important fact, is that General Carol Bolander, Air Force General in 1969, was asked uh, to look at the whole question of what should we do with Project Blue Book. The Condon report earlier that year had recommended closing it, wasn't doing anything useful, which is pretty much true. But anyway, he came at it afresh, had nothing previously to do with it. He was an engineer who worked on the lunar excursion module, which landed 40 years ago, coming right up pretty quick this month. Anyway, in his memo, October uh, 1969, uh, he said that reports of UFOs, which could affect national security, are made in accordance with JNAP, Joint Army Navy Air Force Publication 146, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. As if that wasn't enough, two paragraphs later, he says, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report UFO sightings. However... As previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose, regulations designed for that purpose. Now, I talked to General Bolander. I didn't get this until years after the memo turned up. And he knew exactly what he was saying. Very sharp guy. He's dead now, unfortunately. But uh, uh, you never saw the New York Times mention that, oh, the good cases didn't go to Project Blue Book. Uh, which is the truth. And it's why I get a little upset when people tell me, oh, all these governments overseas are releasing everything. It's hogwash. There's no top secret material there. Well, what's your feelings as to why the media seems to be going along with the government and covering up a lot of, of these incidents that are occurring? Is, is it because of the conspiracy theory? Well, I don't know what the conspiracy theory is. You mean the government asks them to shut up? No, I don't think so. But there is an ego problem here. How do you stand up and admit, you know, we goofed on the most important topic. We have never done our homework. We have missed the important stories for 60 years. We're not going to admit that. Uh, that's part of the picture, that arrogance, that David Susskind syndrome that I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, occasionally the government, I mean, the newspapers do uh, conspire. I mean, the New York Times agreed not to publish an article of, about the Bay of Pigs invasion before, and Jack Kennedy had said that he wished they had, <laughs> so they wouldn't yeah. have done it at the debacle. But in, during World War II, there were orders went out, don't talk about uranium, and don't talk about Japanese Fugo balloons, and the press didn't. So, you know, they have on occasion kowtowed, and there's nothing wrong with that in a time of war. Look, when the first nuclear bomb was tested in uh, New Mexico, uh, July 16th, 1945, it was seen from 100 miles away, <laughs> pretty powerful bomb, clear skies, all that sort of thing. And the sheriffs received all kinds of calls. Well, a couple days later, they put out an article. Ammunition dump had blown up, and fortunately nobody was injured. And it was only until a month later or so after Hiroshima and Nagasaki that, oh, by the way, and that ammunition dump, that was the first test of a nuclear weapon. <laughs> well, you know, tell so me this, sometimes Dan, it's legitimate. <laughs> t tell, tell me this. You know, um, aliens have, have uh, 
been visiting, apparently been visiting this planet since uh, the beginning of human civilization. And, sure. Uh, nice place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there. You know. Yeah. You know, hier hieroglyphic, hieroglyphics have, uh, are depicted flying saucers. Uh, Ezekiel uh, sure. from the Old Testament spoke of a wheel in the air. Uh, a famous painting by Michelangelo shows an object resembling a spacecraft hovering over the Virgin Mary. And of course there have been thousands of uh, sightings of strange objects in the sky yeah. since the Roswell incident. Now, here's the question. Why, why do you suppose we are being visited so frequently as these eyewitness accounts seem to indicate? Well, we don't know how frequently. I mean, this may be the least visited uh, planet in the neighborhood, for that matter. But remember, if you've got motherships, like those aircraft carriers that carry 75 little airplanes that can only operate for two hours without refueling, as opposed to 18 years, and we have many reports of huge motherships, each might carry 75 little ones. So you could wind up with an awful lot of sightings without a lot of visits. But what are they doing here? Uh, my paper has a whole chapter in my book, uh, Flying Saucers and Science, has a whole chapter on that. But let me put it succinctly. I make one assumption about every advanced civilization. Namely, it's concerned about its own survival and security. Everybody we know that applies to. Uh, that being the case, you have to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, but only close tabs on those primitives who show signs of being able to bother you. Now, that was no problem until the end for any aliens in the neighborhood. I mean, they've seen progress, the First World War. There were airplanes and radio messages and stuff like that. But at the end of World War II, there were three signs that soon this primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare, that's Earth, uh, would be out bothering them, soon meaning less than 100 years. The three signs were quite clear. Nuclear weapons, V-2 rockets, which were not being used to send mail from Germany to England, as you recall, <laughs> and radar as a symbol of electronics. There wasn't any radar before the war. Uh, and isn't that amazing? The only place on the entire surface of the Earth in July 1947 where you could study all three of these was southeastern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Roswell is in southeastern New Mexico, but White Sands Missile Range is where the first atom bomb was tested. A, a Trinity site, I was there um, this year. They're only open two days a year. Um, and that's where we were firing the captured German V-2s, and that's where we had our best radar to track the missiles, because uh, sometimes they didn't go where they were supposed to go. <laughs> they went south instead of north. Uh, nice to be able to track them. Uh, so, uh, now, admittedly, I had a haughty English astronomer say, well, they could have gone to the Soviet Union. Sorry, they didn't test their first A-bomb until August 1949. Uh, so, uh, in other words, I think the primary concern is uh, to quarantine us, if you will. I mean, if you were an alien, would you want us out there? Look, World War II, we killed... 50 million of our own kind. Some people say 60, but I'm very conservative, you know. And uh, they destroyed, we destroyed 1,700 of our cities. These aren't nice guys. The total budget for things military this year on planet Earth is well over a trillion dollars. And yet every single day, 30,000 children die of preventable disease or starvation. Now, there's something wrong here. These are not nice guys. Uh, it's more important to kill than it is to feed, uh, judging by how we spend our money, for goodness sakes. So I, I can see why aliens would not want to wait until their own Pearl Harbor, in other words, until the marauding earthlings came popping on by. Uh, the United States made a serious mistake. We underestimated Japan. As a matter of fact, in a very ironic moment, on November 29th, 1941, there was the Army-Navy football game, big rivalry. And in the program, there was a picture of the USS Arizona, mighty battleship, and a comment in the article about it that nobody has ever sunk a battleship from the air. Eight days later, the Japanese sunk the Arizona, killing 1,102 people. So look at all the money we spend on surveillance, you know, spy satellites, uh, agencies like the NSA and the CIA and the NRO and a whole bunch more. 
we're monitoring to make sure we don't get taken by surprise. Wouldn't you expect that aliens would do that? Especially if their first inclination is not just, hey, wipe out that planet, those are bad guys. They seem to be more considerate than that. I think they have a message for us. You know, we've been inundated in recent years with um, accounts of uh, crop circle formations that have popped up in many parts of the world, especially in the U.K. and here in the United States. And, of course, you know, many of these uh, geometrical formations are said to be very precise, suggesting that they, they've, been, they've been carved out by uh, UFOs as messages from the heavens or as warnings to the uh, human race about cataclysmic events that will unfold here on Earth. Are crop circles something to be taken seriously, or are they just a cleverly devised hoax? Well, I think it's someplace in between. Some of them are very beautiful, and you have to ask, well, how'd they do that? Uh, and not all of them were made by Doug and Dave with their boards from the English taverns. Uh, I don't know what they mean, but I think aliens could figure out a better way of communicating with us. I mean, we, we're inundating the atmosphere with radio and television signals. Uh, surely they would pick those up. I mean, I don't know what they make of all the ads on television, but it doesn't matter. I'm sure they could come up with their, a better means of communication. Now, of course, I have no idea what the protocol is between Earthling governments and aliens, if there is one. What can you guys do? You know, But obviously they're not here to go out for tea or a beer with Earthlings. <laughs> and people say, well, why don't they land on a White House lawn? Well, I hate to say it, but the President of the United States does not speak for 6 billion Earthlings. He sometimes doesn't speak for 300 million Americans. So... Uh, they're here for their purposes. I mean, look, I've got squirrels in my backyard and some woods behind the house. Uh, they're rounded quite a lot. Uh, not too much in the wintertime here because we had 13 feet of snow last year. But uh, I don't talk to the squirrels. They don't bother me. I might say something like, get away, or something like that. But I don't treat them as equals. Uh there's no reason for the aliens to treat us as equals. They know that they're tracked on radar. They know there are a lot of different radar systems around. Uh, they've watched our shenanigans. The U.S. has tested over 300 nuclear weapons, you realize. Uh, we're not nice guys. Now, were most of those uh, conducted underground? I know there were some that were above the ground. You mentioned the there one out plenty, in the Pacific. Oh, there were plenty of above-ground tests out in Nevada. They used to, uh, people from Las Vegas used to watch, and they'd line up the troops to watch, unfortunately. And, uh, so not, not all of them were above ground, but quite a few were. And, of course, the British tested, the French tested, the Russians tested. Uh, Pakistan and India have tested. Uh, Korea has tested. Uh, yeah, there were plenty of underground tests, too, but uh, uh, if you're going to use them in warfare, you want to know what happens outside, just like the two at Operation Crossroads in 1946, where one was underwater. This was out in the Pacific, and to see the damage to ships from an underwater burst, and the other was above the water to see the damage to ships from an above-water burst. So there was a lot of this going on, and... What I'm saying is try to stand back and say, how does it look to somebody else? What are these idiots doing? That would be the first question. <laughs> okay, our guest on this edition is uh, Stanton Freeman, a renowned ufologist and former nuclear physicist for such companies as General Electric, General Motors, Westinghouse, and McDonnell Douglas. Stan is the uh, original investigator of the Roswell incident and co-authored Crash at Corona, which defined the Roswell incident. He also co-authored Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience in 2007, followed by Flying Saucers and Science in 2008. Stan has appeared on many television and radio programs, including the Larry King Show, both in 2007 and 2008. He has also provided written testimony before Congress and has appeared before the United Nations. Stan, I, I believe you mentioned that uh, you have known uh, Bill Burns and the UFO investigations he has conducted or been part of for yeah. a number of years. How did you come yeah. to know Bill? Uh, I met him in Roswell. At, we had talked before that, but I met him there when uh, Colonel Corso's book was issued. Bill was a co-author on that. 
I was supposed to get an advanced copy. I didn't, but uh, uh, I wish I had. But anyway, uh, so we met there, and I've been doing a monthly column for UFO Magazine. Uh, Bill's wife, Nancy, edits UFO Magazine. So I've been doing a column for several years now. Also do one on the MUFON Journal. Uh, speaking of which, the 40th Annual Mutual UFO Network Symposium will take place in early August in Denver. Uh, I'll be the first speaker. Uh, Forty years is a long time in the history of a UFO organization, to say the least. And uh, so that should anybody around, you're going to hear a lot of good papers, professional people, and the papers will be available in written form. And uh, <laughs> they're running a, a strange event. The first hundred people to register get a ticket to, and put in a hat, I guess, and whoever draws it gets to have lunch with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not such a bad thing, is it? <laughs> well, I hope not, but uh, it was one of those, gee, you think that anybody's going to want to? And two years ago they did that, people could bid a silent auction, you know, and somebody paid 200 and some dollars for the privilege. It was a good lunch. But <laughs> what, what, is Move, what is MUFON all about? Well, it's got uh, almost 3,000 members. Uh it's got a number of investigative bodies all around the, the world, really, but mostly in the U.S. Each month lately, they've been getting about 500 UFO sighting reports. The idea is scientific investigation, uh, basically for the good of mankind. Uh, uh, for example, they had the radar tapes from the Stephenville, Texas case uh, looked at by somebody who was an expert at such things. And they've started a new program where Investigators get paid. Uh, there's a Las Vegas billionaire who is funding it uh, to do serious investigations. Now, money has always been a problem in UFO research, and so uh, that there's going to be some money available to do a, a good job is, is, is a real benefit. And uh, they, most of these state sections have uh, meetings every month, I was at a conference sponsored by the Illinois State Section a little over a month ago. I've, Orange County in California has a section in Los Angeles and uh, South Carolina and all over the place, Florida. So, And also it's an opportunity for people to become investigators by taking a field investigators test. There's a course you can take and there's an exam to answer and stuff. So for people who have a serious interest and want to get involved, it's the organization to join. It publishes the monthly MUFON journal, for which I do a column. Uh, I've been doing that for, I don't know, six years? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't kept track, uh, which is great fun. And uh, it's, it's a, a serious organization. And I recommend it to people who say, well, how can I get involved? Well, join MUFON. And uh, again, www www.mufon.com will do it. The site is listed on my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. Uh, and I'm looking forward. I, I've been, I've spoken at more annual symposia than anybody, I think. Uh, I, I'm looking forward. It's a chance to meet people. And people tell me that I've lost weight, which is always nice because they've seen me on television and that adds 15 or 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> this happened in Roswell. They all want to take your picture. Oh, you're looking good, Stan. <laughs> of course we I had am. A guest, uh, we had a guest uh, on the show back in, in, in March uh, who, uh, who also attends uh, MUFON. I don't know if you're familiar with Jose Escamilla. Yes, I know Jose. Yeah, he's done a number of documentaries uh, on yeah. UFOs, and I guess he's also the the, the one who uh, um, discovered the rods phenomenon. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, indeed. And uh, there are a lot of strange things that show up in the cameras, incidentally. Uh, yeah, so th I, I know there's a number of uh, interesting people that do attend this uh, this conference. Bud Hopkins has spoken often at MUFON conferences. He's a world-class expert on abductions. Uh, my colleague on Captured, uh, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience, Kathleen Marden, is Betty's niece. And T tell us about the Betty and Barney Hill thing. I know. Would you say this is one of the best documented cases of a, of a UFO experience? Of a UFO abduction, yes, definitely. Uh, primarily, 
because Dr. Benjamin Simon, the psychiatrist who wound up hypnotizing them each separately for uh, weekly for several months, didn't know anything about flying saucers. But he knew a great deal about helping people work through what I would call uh, traumatic stress experiences. We, we today say post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you know, uh, he treated a lot of shell shock war veterans. That's what they called it back in World War II. Had a hospital that he directed 3,000 beds for such people. The Army even made a movie, Let There Be Light, in which he starred. Uh, and so he was able to have them relive the experiences, tape the sessions, uh, induce amnesia at the end of each session so they couldn't talk to each other about it, and uh, get the truth out. Uh, he could ask the same question several different ways as they relive the experience. And uh, it's extremely well done by Dr. Simon. And, I mean, there are times it's frustrating. I, as a ufologist, would wonder, well, I wish he had asked this or that or the other thing. But of particular significance to me is the star map that Betty described under hypnosis, that she was asking the leader where he's from, and he shows her this. It's probably a hologram, but a bunch of stars with patterns, lines between stars. And to make a very long story short, uh, she asks him, where are you on the map? And he says, you know where you are? No, I don't know anything about astronomy, she said. How can I tell you where I'm from if you don't know where you're at? And poor Dr. Simon uh, asked her if she could remember what the map looked like. She said yes. He gives her a post-hypnotic suggestion. She draws it. Later on, it's in the book, The Interrupted Journey, from the mid-60s. Uh, a brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish built 20. Seven different three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood to try to find a pattern that matched uh, the two-dimensional drawing, and eventually did. And that's where Zeta One and Zeta Two reticuli come from. I was the first to publish about that way back in '72 in Saga Magazine, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I worked with Marjorie a bit. Uh, getting more exposure. I convinced uh, Astronomy Magazine to do an article, got more response than anything they'd ever published before or since. Did, did they seem like level-headed uh, people? Well, there's no question. That, that's the no. other part of the story that's important, is that Betty was a social worker, a supervisor in the welfare department state of New Hampshire, worked with adoptions and stuff like that. Barney was uh, it's a mixed marriage. Uh, Betty was white, Barney black, which was rather unusual for the 60s. And uh, Barney worked for the post office, but he also was on the Governor's Civil Rights uh, Commission in New Hampshire. They were active politically, uh, even got invited to Lyndon Johnson's inauguration, and they went, and Kathleen went with them. Uh, she heard about the next day because Betty had called her sister, Kathleen's mother. And so she has transcribed all the tapes. They weren't all transcribed for the interrupted journey. And uh, it, you get a better picture. She's done a comparative analysis. What they each say independently under hypnosis in situations where they were together. So the testimony ought to match. And when they were not together and also uh, she found that the criticism that because Betty had dreams about being abducted, starting several dreams uh, ten days after the event, and wrote them down. Oh, well, Barney must have just uh, read. She probably told him about it a hundred times, said one critic, to be generous. Uh, and so, of course, what he said matched what Betty said. And when you do a comparative analysis, it's simply not true. The dreams do not match what either one of them said. Uh, and so it's a, a well-documented case. And in the book, I take on the role of the heavy. I go over the star map work and Marjorie Fisher's research and then defend against the attacks of the nasty, noisy negativists. And uh, so the book is unique. It's not just a rehash of a case, but gives you new insights. Uh, it's been very well received. Not that it's going to change the minds of the, of the debunkers. They're still repeating garbage. Like, they just saw a light in the sky. It was Jupiter. <laughs> well, you know, a month after the event, before the hypnosis, they were interviewed by an astronomer uh, up in uh, New England, a NICAP investigator, and 
They described this thing coming less than 200 feet away, a double row of windows. Barney had binoculars, looked inside the windows, and there were beings there and so forth. Uh, the critic even says, oh, uh, Mars, or, or yeah, first Mars, then Jupiter, they saw it fly in front of the moon. That's a neat trick for Jupiter, you know. Uh, there's so much wrong with the attacks. You know, I heard that same account by, by a skeptic. Uh, you know, there's been so many UFO sightings over Mexico City for some reason. Yes. And I, I believe that, I can't recall his name, but I saw the documentary, I think it was either on the History Channel or Discovery Channel, and this was a skeptic of, of uh, recent events in, in uh, Mexico City. And he said the same thing. He says, oh, all they're seeing is the planet Venus. Well, you know, it, it's utter nonsense in the Hill case. As a matter of fact, they described it being seen along the old man of the mountain, which has since fallen into the local lake, but it was a major symbol in New Hampshire. It was one and a half to two times the size of the old man of the mountain. It was right alongside it. That's 48 feet, and this is bigger than that. Now, this is Venus or Jupiter or Mars. It's kind of like the, um, the J Japanese airline case, JAL, where uh, this was identified as the skeptics as Jupiter and Mars. Oh, extraterrestrial, all right. The only trouble is it was picked up by the plane's radar and ground radar alongside the 747 Japan Airline Flight 800. Uh, and station kept with them as they, with permission from the ground, flew in a circle. Now, how do you make that into Jupiter? I mean, you know, airplane radar can't pick up Jupiter on top of it. But uh, so... Yeah, the skeptics that remember, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. Uh, yes, most sightings can be explained, but it's the ones that can't be, and this one certainly can't be. And the explanations for the Hill case, some of them border on the truly uh, absurd. Oh, they lost their way in the hills. That's why they got home two, two hours later than they should have. Well, there aren't many roads. There certainly weren't back then. It's New Hampshire mountainous sort of thing, and... Uh, there's no way you could spend two hours being lost, you know, no matter how you try. And Kathleen has tried, incidentally. Uh, and so, uh, again, you know, you could say you feel pity for the debunkers, but I wish they'd shut up until they get facts in hand. Do you think the skeptics will ever relent when it comes to uh, uh, no, accepting look, the facts? No, uh, there are still people who uh, don't believe we've been to the moon, uh, who still believe that the Earth is flat, uh, of course, that falls into the conspiracy theory type of thing, too, doesn't it? Well, I, I suppose. There are people, that, you know, in the other direction, they can't be real because the Bible doesn't say anything. They should read the book, The Bible and Flying Saucers, by Dr. Barry Downing, which goes through the Old and New Testaments and finds lots of UFO sightings. Right. I'll say UFO rather than flying saucer because they didn't use the word saucer back then. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, I, I try to aim... I. I Think in terms of the uh, the bell-shaped curve. You know, if you plot most natural phenomena, height, for example, versus number, you find it settles in the middle, and there are some extremes at both ends. There are some seven-footers, and there are some four-footers, but most are someplace in between. Well, I find most people are, uh, well, they're, they're on the fence. They're not sure. They're healthy agnostics, I call them. But the extremists, the people who say these things can't possibly be real, don't bother me with the facts, or who say, I know they're here to save us, don't bother me with the facts. I try to ignore the 10% on each end of that curve because there's no point in wasting your time on them. Uh, I don't speak to convince the debunkers. I'm interested in educating the public. The people who say, well, maybe, uh, let me hear what you have to say. And that, that's a very different situation. Uh, you know, how do you convince the skeptics? I don't give a darn about the debunkers. What's they, your they estimate? Aren't skeptics, you realize. Uh, what, uh, what's your um, What's your estimates on uh, the number of people who have had actual close encounter experiences? Uh, well, with, you know, you have to define close encounter. But I, I do this. I check my audiences at the end of my lecture. Typically, uh, and I, I'll make a comment. My, I get the first question, the question, the answer. How many people here believe they've seen 
what I would describe as a flying saucer. I've defined my terms early on. And I'll make a comment. We didn't let the CIA in. You know, just raise your hand. It's okay. And the hands go up very carefully, I'll say. And I point and count. One, two, three, four. By the time I move to my right, the hands are going up much more vigorously. Each person thinks he's the only one, you know. Typically, 10% of the audience believes they've seen one. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? If I'm lucky, it's one in ten. Uh-huh. Now, if there's anybody left, I'll say, were you in the military at the time? And if there are, I'll ask if they want to tell us about it. I had one guy in front of 1,350 people said, I can't, they told me not to say anything, which was a great Well, you know what I think the problem is, is when you're photographing an incident or recording an incident, as you mentioned, is that, a lot, a lot of the skeptics are going to come back and say, well, you're just using Photoshop. That's an easy thing to use. Well, you do have to watch out on pictures. That's why all the pictures I use are old ones before there was a Photoshop. Uh, I worry about pictures, you know, because any 14-year-old can make great UFO pictures. But there are pictures that have, done, have gone under investigation by people like Dr. Bruce McAbee. He's an optical physicist, for goodness sakes. Worked for a Navy research lab for over 30 years. Has looked at more darn UFO pictures than you can imagine. And so, uh, you know, I don't care. The the Photoshop possibility, that goes in the gray basket, maybe. But uh, it's the ones that are carefully investigated. Those are the only ones we can do anything with. And today it's tough because everybody's got these little uh, telephone, uh, you know, cell phone cameras, and they're not scientific instruments the resolution on today's digital cameras is very poor compared to the old uh, cameras Uh, you can see that incidentally the pictures taken in general ramey's office at the time of roswell he's holding a memo in his hand and the picture is taken from a minimum of 10 feet away but they were using a a, a speed graphic press camera four by five negative and the resolution is way better than anything you could do today with one of these. Uh, Are you referring to the photographs of the crash site or of the, uh, the no, material? No, the crash site. No, the, in General Ramey's office in Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, okay. You're talking about the material. Well, I'm talking about the little piece of paper he's holding in his hand. And in one okay. of the pictures, mm-hmm. it's facing toward the camera. Right. Well, uh, today, Dr. David Rudiak, who I saw last week, uh, has used, he's an optometrist, expert on vision, uh, has used modern techniques to try to read the print. And uh, there are actually computer programs where if you put in the first, third, fifth, and sixth letters, they can give you all the possible words, you know, in English. That plus looking at the the, the letters themselves, and uh, that says victims of the wreck and stuff like that. Uh, now, the Air Force said, oh, we gave that to an agency. They didn't say who, and we didn't see anything there. Well, when I show the slide on the screen, uh, I had scans done of the original negative. Uh, there's no question there's letters and words there, and some everybody agree on. So, <clears throat> yeah, you need investigation. And certainly nobody would have thought uh, with today's cameras you'd never be able to read that thing. The resolution just isn't good enough. Uh, so you do have to be careful, and you don't jump up and down. Isn't that great? I, I get all kinds of people sending me email with a, a light in the sky that they watch for quite a while. Isn't that exciting? No, frankly, <laughs> it isn't. You know, seen one, you've seen a hundred. You got to go with the good stuff, not with the maybes, you know, possibles and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you you've got to be selective in the choice of what you believe and what you examine and most of us serious people in the field are we recognize that there's these gray areas and the pictures over Mexico City for example I don't know what they are Uh, I'm not saying they're flying saucers though there was one um, I have it published uh, on our website um, at earthfrenzyradio.com of a uh, a large mothership um, over Mexico City in which there are a number of orbs that are being released by this mothership. Now, this was released by YouTube uh, last night, and apparently it's 
already received more than a quarter million um, uh, hits. So yeah, now the problem with those uh, stuff on YouTube, and you, if you put my name in on YouTube, you'll get 600 hits. You can watch me see 600 different things. Probably gone up to 700 now after the weekend. <laughs> <But> <laughs> the trouble is you have no way to evaluate them. You don't know much about the camera. It, most of the time, all you see in the picture is this orb and the stuff. It, you really can't make a judgment. You can say it's interesting uh, and provocative, but you certainly can't say it's a flying saucer. What would you say about the one that was over O'Hare Port uh, a few years back? Well, okay, that is another story entirely. The testimony there clearly indicates a round metallic object sitting beneath the clouds, whose height we know, and that left uh, after 15 minutes or so, being watched by United Airlines people, uh, and goes straight up and drills a hole in the clouds. Uh, that's a very exciting report. And one of the outcomes of that was that uh, the Chicago Tribune transportation reporter of all people, it sounds reasonable, published an article on July 1st, I guess it was 2008, maybe seven. I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. It got more response on their website, more hits, over a million. The, that front page article, he did a good job, uh, including checking after the FAA said, oh, we don't know anything, so he filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and oh, yeah, yeah, I guess we did hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the Trib actually ran a little article saying they were totally astonished at the response. He got calls for interviews from all over the world. It led the list in terms of hits uh, on an article for three days, which never happens. So that was a very good case. Uh, and uh, Dr. Richard Haynes, who used to work for NASA on the West Coast, has written a long report on that for NARCAP, National Aviation Reporting Center for Anomalous Phenomena, pilot sightings, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, gone into great detail on it, and a uh, fine case. Uh, so that one, again, there were a number of witnesses Several of them were very much trained aviation types. This wasn't in the distance at night. You know, it was in the daytime and right over uh, E-Terminal, I think, at uh, O'Hare. Uh, and the way it left was certainly different. So we really need to decipher truth from reality when it comes to uh, photographs sure. or movies of uh, flying objects. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are some good ones. Uh, my movie UFOs are real has several hunks of motion picture footage in it. Uh, it's now available in DVD on my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. But uh, you go for the good stuff. Look, th there are only two naturally occurring isotopes that are fissionable. There are hundreds that aren't. If you want to build a nuclear reactor, use the ones that aren't. You don't care about the ones that aren't. So... If you want to find out about flying saucers, you'd look at the work on the unknowns. Not on the knowns. They're not worth spending much time with. Well, in closing, Stan, uh, do, do you feel that the mystery of, of uh, flying saucers will ever be solved, or are we going to be subjected to a, uh, a continuous, massive government cover-up? Well, I'm an optimist. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, lecturing and writing and all that, if I wasn't an optimist. Yeah, I think it'll be solved. Whether it'll be within my lifetime or not, I don't know. I turned 75 at the end of the month, so my parents both lived to be 89, so I got a while ago. But still, <laughs> uh, who knows? Events beyond our control. Uh, you know, I can't do much about it besides tell the truth out there in as wide a circle as I can find. Stan Friedman, thank you again for the, this opportunity to uh, speak on a subject that has captured our imagination for decades and continues to be one of, if, if not the most important topics of the centuries, the mystery of the UFO phenomena. We hope that you have a safe journey, and we wish you the best with your lectures and your upcoming events. Thank you very much. Good thank day. you, Stan. Take okay. care.